Yep. You are live. I'm live. The recording okay. has started. Yes. Great. Great. Hello, friends. Uh, <laughs> thank you for for joining us. This is my first time doing a live stream on YouTube, and uh, we're here with uh, award-winning YouTuber JJ McCullough. Welcome, JJ. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for being on. Um, I. Yeah, I'm referred to you by by some people as as Jeff with one F, but you have been known to call me your artist pal Jeffrey, um, <laughs> which is a a fun name. Um, yeah. That's that's my first question for you. Why why did you decide to refer to me as Jeffrey? I guess I don't know. That's kind of instinctively what I do with a lot of people. When I was young, I, I was really sort of told that you should call people by their their full Christian names whenever possible. But that's sort of like the polite thing to do, especially for people that you don't have a very close relationship with. And then that is sort of something that I've kind of carried with me for all of my life. And I guess it's become a bit of a bit of an affectation <laughs> in adulthood where, you know, when somebody's Matt, I'm always called them Matthew, or if they're Jeff, I call them Jeffrey, or if they're Dave, I call them David. I just kind of feel like that's a more polite thing to do unless they specifically tell me not to, which sometimes people hate their, their long form names. So I'm, I'm sensitive to that, but I feel like sometimes people don't mind it. I don't know. Does it bother you? Uh, no, no, I like it. Yeah, I feel like I've been I've been kind of clinging to the Jeff with one F um, for for my personal branding. You know, like this. Here's a, a pin with my logo here, where I'm really oh, yes. embracing the the single F thing. But no, I do find the yeah the politeness that you've got going on with the <laughs> um, Jeffrey full, full <laughs> name is uh. Yeah, it, it's it's very charming. I'm a fan of it. Wow. Actually, I just remembered I have a banner here. So this is, oh, yes. <laughs> this is the title of our talk right now. JJ talks to Jeffrey. Once in, a, once in a while, you do encounter people that for some reason, their parents only called them, like only gave them the short form of their of the name, which is always a little a little odd. And then you always run the risk of, uh, of, of, of sort of bothering people like that. You know, like I met a guy a while ago who went by Willie, and I just assume oh, it was William, and I kept calling him William, and then he was like, you know, it's actually just Willie, and he showed me, like, the, the driver's license, and there's no long form of the name, although I think that that can be, I don't know, people can call people whatever they want, but it does, when you have a short, only a short form of a name, I feel like you have to spend a lot of time explaining to people that it's just that, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My my real Christian name is is Jeffrey, of course, with with the two Fs. I you know shorten it to the one F just to to stand out from from you know all the other Jeffs out there, and you know have have a, a better claim on you know uh, usernames and. Uh, do you know what? Do you know, do you know what? Do you know what my name is? I I was just gonna say yeah, you you're all of this. Uh, I I feel like I should know, but I I really don't. Yeah, what is your real name? Is this a an exclusive i guess i'm kind of a i guess i'm kind of a hypocrite for this because since i go by this initial name and i've always gone by initial name ever since i was a little baby because and this is like the story that i always tell is that when i was born in the 1980s it was sort of briefly uh fashionable for uh little boys to have little initial names so like you know that's why when you watch kind of like tv shows from a certain era there will often be like boy characters who are called like DJ and PJ and RJ and all that kind of thing. And so mm. my parents were kind of swept up in that. And so they called me JJ and it's just John James, but like nobody calls me John James except for like, you know, substitute teachers or yeah, you know, yeah. Like people John that are James. maybe the person at the passport office or something like that. But no, it's even like, there's even like pictures of me, like, or like VHS home movies of me as a kid. And it's like, oh, little JJ, have your Cheerios or whatever. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it was a conscious decision to only be initials for my whole life. And sometimes I forget kind of how weird that is because it does feel a little dated. Like you just don't meet people with initial names as much as I think you used to. And a lot of times it's something that people grow out of as they get older. So I've thought about making a video on this topic at some point, just reflecting on, on having a, a weird kind of dated name. And if that's, that's been consequential for me in any way you feel like it's a trend like it's it's not as cool as it used to be or do yeah. you feel like it's just well it's it's more specifically for younger like children to to go by the initials in that way i think i think it was like at one time and i think like these days it's kind of fallen out of fashion like i just don't feel like you just meet as many people like sometimes people choose to go by their initials like 
like mm-hmm. authors often do and, and sort of sure. stuff like that. Yeah. But like to just meet like a random person who like introduces themselves. So it's like, hi, I'm TJ. Like, I think that to a lot of people that that comes off as, as kind of immature. And I sometimes or, or it comes off as like a name that they've chosen for themselves, you know, and I'm, I sometimes get a little self conscious or like you're, you're like, I think about this a lot, like when I'm dating and stuff like that. It's like, hi, I'm mm. JJ. And it's like, mm, like you're like withholding something from yourself. It's like, oh, and I'm Mr. X. It's like you're trying to be like mysterious. And, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to do that, but I guess like, I think some people associate it. It has this sort of unnecessary kind of affected air to it. And sometimes I get self-conscious about it if I think of it too much, but a lot of times I don't think about it because it's just my name. And I'm so used to just going by it as I have for my whole 40 years of life. Yeah. I I, I think it suits you well. I, I do hear what you're saying when you say it's dated. It's- Maybe it's a little bit of a kind of '90s tastic, like <laughs> skateboarding teenager kind of thing to be yeah. like a a TJ or or a JJ or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you you know you're one of those people on the internet who ha- who carries this sort of youthful energy, even as you you embrace Age. aging, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, even though you've you've been one to talk about or reflect on on the act of aging. Uh, yeah, beautiful. So we have some chats actually. Uh, Hal Hollywood says JJ is a dynamite name. You get that? Do you get that reference? Uh, is that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. That's, is that? That's a God. I I even barely get that reference. It's a reference to a show where there was a character named JJ, and his catchphrase was dynamite. This is like a show from like the seventies, I think really okay what, it was like a show with like a lot of like these cool black guys in it i i, I know very little about it My, i think the show that huggy bear maybe it starts starsky and hutch maybe that oh really the, okay i have not yeah. yeah i mean i've heard of i'm familiar with the show but i haven't ever seen yeah. a minute so of it that guy that guy's probably one of the most famous the famous jj's next to uh jj abrams and then uh, of course noted youtube superstar ksi is also named jj hmm right I was when I was thinking about the '90s. I was thinking about Barney, the dinosaurs' friend. Um, oh yeah, is it BJ or BJ? C- yeah, 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 BJ. Uh, somewhat of an unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, that one hasn't gone over so well, particularly in a kids' show. Uh, all, all right. Well, um, I, I suppose the the main topic that I had um, pre you know pre decided for for our discussion today was just this idea of long form content versus short form yeah this is this is something I, i've thought about a lot uh as someone who, who for the past like several years i suppose i have been making like TikTok style short form videos like a uh, vertical orientation and a minute or less in length and i've uh just recently decided uh or i don't i don't maybe decided it's too strong of a word i'm just starting to dip my toes into the the youtube waters and con- start to consider um trying to make more long form uh horizontal videos mm. and the whole thing seems seems very daunting and intimidating to me at this point uh i don't know if, if you have thoughts on that jj yeah, as someone well, who's kind of started from the other direction it's it's interesting because i feel like so like you for any of perhaps my people that are watching and are, are kind of less familiar with with you but like you are one of these guys that is a big deal on the TikTok, not as much on YouTube, right? So it's like TikTok has been your entry point. And then you're sort of trying to, like you just sort of said, like you're trying to transition your sort of TikTok success into YouTube success, which is a thing that you see happen a lot. And a lot of the times yeah. they, uh, you know, they do it through YouTube shorts. Uh, I mean, a lot of, do you do that at all? Like do you repurpose just any of your TikToks just to YouTube shorts or for that matter to like Instagram reels? I do. Yeah. I, I, years ago, like 2021, I was just like, I was just focusing on TikTok and, you know, I went through a season where I was trying to like produce a a TikTok video every single day and I was Mm. basically editing all of it in app. So of course it has the, the TikTok watermark on there and everything. And more recently I've started to just like um edit everything on my computer and then kind of upload it to all three so TikTok, Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts and that so that's kind of interesting to see how like the literally the exact same video performs like differently on three different platforms 
Uh, is there any conclusion that you've that you've been able to draw of it then? Oh boy, a conclusion. I mean, some sometimes it, it feels somewhat random. I mean, I know like uh, on TikTok, oftentimes they talk about you know when you see those videos about how to like go viral on TikTok, people people say like okay, they want to incentivize you to edit in app. They want to keep you like in the app, and and so that if you do download it, it has the watermark, so everyone knows that it started with TikTok. Yeah. Um, so I I do potentially see that sometimes. Sometimes I do feel like I'm I'm getting some kind of a not edited in app prejudice on on TikTok by like not doing as well. Um, but at the same time, it, it does seem somewhat random. Um, honestly, the I mean the the reason I just recently got uh, a few more subscribers on YouTube here is because I I made. A, video again edited it on the computer on DaVinci and just like uploaded it to all three and I, th I think it got the most views on on YouTube and it was it was the video where I was explaining the whole saga of the Mickey Mouse um, yeah. public domain t-shirt design yeah that, that you're wearing <laughs> thank you yeah. for representing <laughs> appreciate that yeah um yeah it, it did pretty well on on all three platforms i believe but yeah i actually like was able to get to gain some new subscribers from all the the attention and all the comments that i was getting on mm. on the youtube shorts yeah mm. and are, are you, you you're making you're making money from TikTok as well i assume right no i'm i'm not monetized no you're not. i mean I, so how does that no. how does that work see this is because mm -hmm. in canada uh yeah. you cannot monetize TikTok at all so like oh, really? okay. with youtube how, do you know what where the metric is because like you know this was a while ago for me but it's like there's some point you cross on youtube where you can mm -hmm. monetize your videos and you can start having ads and all the rest of it and you can start making money how does it work on the TikTok side yeah that's a good question I, I haven't even looked into it for a while i remember again like pro probably back in 2021 maybe 2022 i was that at the time I was much more serious, much more diligent about like uploading every day and was like really fixated on you know, like making that like a substantial part of my career. Um, I, I, I would say like I, it still has in a sense of like I've like, you know, I've gained exposure as cringy as that is with like people have found me through TikTok and like, you know, then gone to my website and emailed me. So that that's the way I have made some money off of it is by getting like graphic design clients out of it. Yes. But yeah, I have not directly monetized it. I remember, uh, so going back to like er, the earlier days when I was newer to TikTok and I had, I think, I don't know, maybe I had like 10,000 subscribers at the time and I, um, you know, signed up through the whole, the creator fund, I think is what it was called. And like, oh, yeah. you know, uploaded all the paperwork and everything. And I, and then I think it would, I just left it at pending, you know, just waiting for approval. And then after I did all that, I started researching more and just was reading articles where people were saying like oh yeah i uh you know i get seven million views regularly and i made like twenty dollars this month or something mm. like that so at, at that point i just felt pretty discouraged and <laughs> about the prospect of ever like making any serious money off of it anyway mm. and have, haven't really looked into it since mm. yeah yeah i feel like there was definitely a time where people were really being sort of discouraged mm -hmm. on the monetization front like i mean i even remember like reading things about that with with youtube uh, years ago and just making it seem like it was the most like hopeless pointless i mean i i don't know enough about the difference with with TikTok and whether or not that is true or not but it's it's what's always sort of striking to me is that like here in canada where you just cannot monetize it at all there are still people who are like creating so much TikTok content, right? Like, mm -hmm. and that is always just like, and I always talk, like sometimes I'll meet people who are like Canadians who are very prolific on TikTok and I'll ask them, it's like, why do you do this if you cannot monetize it? Like from a YouTube perspective where, you know, yeah. the money is good, I think. Again, like, you know, I don't know how hard it is to, to, to climb the hill at this point, but it's mm -hmm. just like, it just seems so inexplicable to me. But, you know, a lot of times people say things like, well, you know, it's how I help it's how I get clients or how it's how I build my brand. And, you know, I direct people to other things that I do that is important to me and all that, which I guess makes sense. And I guess in that sense, like the analogy would probably be YouTube shorts because like YouTube shorts, you can monetize them in theory, but it is very difficult to do so. 
And uh, in the sense that like the money you make from them is very, very small on YouTube shorts, you know, used to used, YouTube shorts, not used to not be monetizable at all. Now they are. But even like if you have a YouTube short that gets millions of views, yeah, the amount of revenue you pull in is pretty small. So the only way that you can rationalize doing them, I think, is to build the channel, right? And right, I feel right. like in, I had a period of time where I was making a lot of YouTube shorts. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was also a period of time in which my channel was growing very rapidly. You know, my channel's not growing very rapidly now, which is kind of frustrating. And so I often kind of think like, well, do I need to return to YouTube shorts and maybe use that as a kind of advertising since they, you know, much like TikTok, when you load up the YouTube shorts, uh, uh, you know, uh, app, mm -hmm. it just feeds you an endless stream of them. And, and, you know, as a result, people are exposed to channels that they wouldn't ordinarily be exposed to. And then, you know, when you're watching a YouTube short, there's a button that allows you to subscribe to the full channel right then and there. And so that's very... Uh, that can be pretty helpful. But the but the issue as well, I think, is that one of the reasons why I was very successful with YouTube Shorts was because I was a very early adopter. And when mm -hmm. people were kind of like initially skeptical of it or didn't know if it was going to be a thing or not, like I was like very excited by the promise of it. And I just made a ton of, uh, of Shorts, you know, early and often. And then so that I think helped me stand out at a time when the YouTube uh, shorts uh, shelf, as they call it, was full of just a lot of repurposed TikToks, a lot of repurposed, you know, Instagram reels and stuff. Mm -hmm. But now it's it's much more competitive, you know, like now you have a lot of people that are making content for, for the YouTube short shelf specifically. And as a result, I find that my shorts are not, you know, pulling in the big numbers that they they used to, which is what has made me a little bit more discouraged and why I don't think I've made a YouTube short in several months. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's gone up and down, it seems, because, yeah, I'd, I similarly, like, a couple years ago was sort of, like, trying to get on that bandwagon, and it, it seemed like it was, I don't know, I mean, it was just completely chaotic and random, like, yeah. you know, some, some shorts could get thousands of views for me and some could get, like, you know, less than 100. And it, it didn't seem like there was a, a ton of rhyme or reason to it. Even even stuff that like included like a, a TikTok watermark or um, maybe even like included like music from from the TikTok app or something like that. It seemed like sometimes that, to my to my amazement, it would still work and do pretty well uh, mm. as a YouTube short. And I I mean I, I guess I just assumed that YouTube would discriminate against that because of course they would want stuff to be native to their own app. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I mean, and of course, like it's it's not all about money, right, JJ? I mean, did you did you find any enjoyment in the the creation of this short form content, or yeah. how was that? How was that yeah. for you? Did you think that I mean, was a fun way to do it, or yeah, like part of the reason why I went into t uh, YouTube Shorts with such sort of gusto was mm -hmm. not because I you know thought that they would make me any money, because like as I said initially, you couldn't make any money at all on Shorts; they could not be monetized. Yeah. But I was very attracted to I mean, I mean, you can probably relate to this as an artist, right? Like there's something about like working within limitations, within confines that I find very stimulating. So like yeah. the idea of like trying to make a video, you know, and my videos are like educational. I'm trying to communicate uh, fact-based knowledge about a topic and trying to see how much kind of fact-based knowledge I can communicate in only 60 seconds is kind of compelling to me. Like that's fun. Like that's a fun kind of creative writing assignment fundamentally and you know it's a uh, sort of communications challenge you know it's it's these kinds of things that i'm interested in and what i often say to people is that it reminded me a lot of uh, my other job which has been to be a newspaper columnist and like when you're a newspaper columnist like you have to write you have to convey an argument in like 750 words and you have to hold tight to that because otherwise it won't fit in the newspaper like the 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 word count is is a, is a hard limit and I like stuff that works with hard limits. Like, I, I think it just forces you to be much more. It's like when you're drawing, you know, and it's like, you know, like, say with this shirt, right? Like you're drawing mm -hmm. with a limited palette of colors. So you have to be like more creative and economical and how you're using line and color and where the negative spaces and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so. I'm, yeah, I'm, well, yeah, with that shirt, especially because uh, after the, the initial version got taken down, I, yeah, I made it a point to let's just make it single color. So it'll be a black and white design yeah but but like yeah. you, have, you have a like minimalistic sort of style in general right so it's like you mm -hmm. you you can appreciate uh 
you know, trying to communicate sort of visual information with just, you know, uh, with within limitations, right? Like that, that is that is sort of like creatively stimulating. It, it, it provides a sort of challenge that is sort of fun to to do. Whereas I think that like in the same way that, you know, I think that blogging or, uh, you know, sub stacks and stuff like that is often generates worse writing than I think old fashioned newspaper column writing does, because when you give people an unlimited uh, sort of word count, sorry, hmm. a lot of ambulances going by. Today. Yeah, I hear that. Is that everything all right? <laughs> I live, I live right. Well, I don't live. I'm in my studio right now, and it's kind of like right in the real uh, bad part of town. I'm sorry to say. So, yeah. there, but this is a particularly noisy night. But um, what was I saying? That you know, like with people with Substacks and blogs mm. and stuff, when they don't have to work with a word count, a lot of time people get like way too verbose, and they write like thousands and thousands of words to communicate something that could have been communicated in like less than a thousand words. Right. And yeah. I think it's the same with, with YouTube videos, frankly, there's kind of this hot trend in the YouTube world right now to make like two hour videos, three hour videos, four hour videos in, in sort of my realm, the realm of sort of like, you know, pseudo educational. Hmm. Whereas like a lot of times you think like, man, that could have been communicated in like 15 minutes if you'd really tried hard. And then it's kind of fun to think like, well, what uh how about just trying to communicate something complex in just 60 seconds like why not give that a shot so i don't know like i find it just a fun thing to do as an end unto itself yeah bre brevity is the soul of wit mm. i i feel like so so firmly like um comfortable in that space of the very short form like i remember again like initially when i was trying to like come up with ideas and what to talk about to make like TikTok content. I, I believe at the time there was just the hard limit of it. It literally couldn't be over 60 seconds long. And at, at first it seemed like a challenge of like, oh, how am I going to, how am I going to say everything I, I want to say in such a short confined amount of time? But I, pretty quickly, I kind of got used to it and, and like really enjoyed kind of the process of editing it down and, and being like, you know, I can take these clips and then put them at two times speed with like B-roll type stuff and just edit, you know, if, if I'm recording voiceover, of course, just like edit out all the empty space between each yes. word and just, yeah, the process of just whittling it down to like, can I make this 30 second video, a, a 25 second video, you know, and yeah. just by trimming off the, the tiny little hairs of things. And then uh, again, like that's why, f from my perspective, like the the idea of like trying to make a video that's like 10, 20 minutes long just seems incredibly daunting. Um, as you know, especially if you if you want it to be visually compelling the whole time with like including mm -hmm. B roll and graphics and stuff. That's just a whole lot more content to produce uh, yes. for <laughs> for just one video. Um, yeah, and, and again, I mean, I've I've just sort of like been dabbling with a little bit i've been experimenting by by trying to just turn like i have an idea in my head of like something that's been on my mind that i want to talk about um and and i'll just kind of like talk at the camera for a while and you know then in in post-production edit out all of the the verbal clutter and the tangents yeah. that have nothing to do with anything and stuff and i feel like uh you know it, it makes for pretty bad content i must say i'm not yeah. i don't think that my youtube videos are are super great so far. Um, a couple of them have gotten a lot of comments because I made one that was kind of talking about all of my my musings on religion and like my my super conservative religious family and talking about whether or not I should continue to engage that conversation with them. So of course, yeah. I guess I guess it makes sense that a lot of people had a lot of opinions about that. Mm. Um, but I don't know. I I just it seems like I mean as you as you are attest to like it, it's basically a full-time job to produce like a, a 10 15 minute video yeah once a week yeah which... yeah like i work <laughs> i work like you know usually six sometimes seven full days making uh making these videos right because it's mm -hmm. like i mine are all completely scripted too right which is sort mm -hmm. of like the other thing and i kind of have a sense that you know if there's a a, a, sort of like a 20 minute video is like about 3000 words. I think it's sort of like the speed that I speak and, you know, I speak relatively fast and uh, yeah. And then you film it and then it's just the editing just takes days and days and days and days, particularly if you aspire to have videos that are, you know, visually stimulating. And I, although I mm -hmm. even feel like and even mine are probably relatively easy to make compared with how a lot of YouTubers make their videos where there's like, 
you know, you're amassing a great deal of footage and then you have to like, you know, what you you're out and about and doing things and you're having a bunch of different footage filmed on different days or of different scenes. And you kind of have to chop that all up into a single narrative, which I think is kind of like closer to some of the stuff of your short form stuff that you've done, right. Where you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're showing different stuff. Like, it's not just basically like, cause like my format, as you know, right. Like it's just mm -hmm. me sitting in the room in front of all my various knickknacks. And then, you know, once in a while I'll like gesture at the camera and then I have a thing that sort of like fills the frame for that, which mm -hmm. is, you know, it's time consuming to make all of those graphics. But on the other hand, it's much less time consuming than if I had just like endless B roll of, you know, me walking around or me in the car or whatever different places I've gone to. And then I have to, you know, like my, do you know, do you know, Michael Downey, beloved Canadian, uh, YouTube. Mike, Michael Downey. No, I don't. You don't. You might. You might like some of his stuff because you're a bit of a nomad, right? And so is he. <laughs> he. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael makes like videos about like his travel adventures around uh, the world, basically. And you know, he works in this studio with me. And well, he used to. He doesn't live here anymore. But uh, but whenever he would be editing here with his team, because of course he has a team because he's a real big shot. It would be yeah. like they would just be like pouring over like hours and hours of footage that he had gathered, you know, on his recent trip to Norway or whatever. And then they have to like cut down all of this hours and hours of footage into a single, you know, like 20 minute video. And that could take like weeks and weeks and weeks. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's like, it's, it seems so intimidating to me. And yet that's just how a lot of YouTubers make their videos. But at the same time, I guess they are, they're also not making a video every single week. So there's only mm -hmm. sacrifices and trade-offs that have to be made. Yeah, and of course he's I mean, theoretically he's living the dream, right? Because he gets, you know, in a, in a sense he gets paid to go to Norway and and go on all these wild adventures as long yeah. as he gets like compelling footage to use later in yeah in a documentary. I mean, he, he has I and mean, he has a team that helps him. Although it okay. but then like the the but the other sort of side of the thing is that you know if you're making a living doing this, you want the time to be like rewarded by the money that is being generated, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it's like, if something is taking a great deal of time to make, you want to make sure that when you do post that video, it's, it's popular, like it's popular enough. It gets enough views that you're generating sort of significant revenue that you're turning a profit and all of this for, for your time and the people that you're hiring. And if you're going on trips or whatever, you know, that it all sort of, balances out and that's always a that's always a challenge too is whereas i think that um you know to talk about like short stuff <clears throat> i mean i know full well and you do as well that like making a short video can be pretty surprisingly time consuming at times as well but yeah yeah in the grand scheme of things it is a smaller investment of time and thus you know the flop to hit is perhaps more uh more more I don't know, like you can, you can just handle the flops a bit easier because relative, like a video that you, I don't know, spent like a few hours editing mm -hmm. relative to a video you spent a whole, you know, weeks editing, right? Like the, this, the pain is a little bit less. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And of course it makes a huge difference if you're not like depending on the performance of that video to pay your rent or, yes. <laughs> or, uh, feed you or yeah. Um, yeah. Again, like, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not seeing myself as someone who's, who's able to like be a full-time content creator in terms of like making money via monetization anytime soon, you know, as, as much as that, that seems like the dream. It also seems like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, what a monkey's paw situation. Is that the right way to put it? Like you feel you like feel both a blessing and a curse. It's well, but do you feel like it's, it's too far off for you? Cause I mean, like, it doesn't seem unrealistic for me. Like mm -hmm. just knowing you and seeing the content that you've made so far to imagine that you could be successful in this realm. Yeah, I, I suppose it, it depends, you know, it depends on, <laughs> I guess, my, you know, my own dedication and, and work ethic um, and also combination of that. And perhaps if I if I get some more lucky breaks from the algorithm or something like that mm -hmm. to to boost my numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to what I was saying about like getting clients and getting exposure that way i i do feel like to some extent i'm already making money as a content creator in that way um it's i mean i guess it's impossible to know at this point like 
where where my freelance career would be without social media. I do know there are like other like illustrators and graphic designers who are kind of outspoken about that. The fact that you don't need to be on social media. You can have a successful career just just via your professional connections mm. and stuff like that. Um but <laughs> I don't I don't know. I feel like my my style and my stuff is is not necessarily the the I don't know. I feel like so much of it has to do with like my personality more so than my like, competency as as a skilled draftsman or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, they, well, I mean, you're obviously a pretty eccentric character, right? So, like, you feel like that that is like what what is sort of seducing people to hire you? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. people, I think people connect with the human side of me more because I just thinking back to like before I was making an effort on TikTok, I was just, you know, like posting my graphics on Instagram. And I, it never would have occurred to me that I'd be the type of person who would like, shoot and edit videos and like be on camera talking about myself and stuff like that and initially i was trying to make a lot more videos that were more about the creative process of like here's how i make animated gifs and after effects and stuff mm -hmm. like that and I would, I would i still do that kind of thing sometimes but i i often just maybe because of the pressure i put on myself to make a, a new video every day i ended up just talking about like my feelings or just like random topics that were on my mind at the time and oftentimes those would do better and get more response um sure. than the the graphic design stuff and yeah I, I literally have had clients who like emailed me and, and when i was talking when i talked to them they'll say like oh yeah i found you because i saw you posted this this video that was, had nothing to do with your graphic design stuff and then i had just dug deeper and found your website and now i want you to you know do this illustration for me yeah. or something like that I, I, um, I, I that that makes that makes perfect perfect sense to me like yeah. i mean i suppose it depends on the client you know i, I imagine mm -hmm. that there's you know you're you're attracting a different type of client than perhaps people for whom the personal side or the personality is 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 less yeah. of a draw but no yeah. i mean like it's, it seems it seems fun i think to like hire a kind of cool or kind of like fun person where it's like oh i'm hiring this guy he's like really cool and like he's going to make something cool for me that's going to be infused with his sort of eccentricities and then that's going to you know come into the product and i want my product to have like a bit of like you know jeffrey's kind of like quirky energy you know totally infused into it which is which is cool it's a, it's a very cool uh very cool strategy yeah yeah i mean i guess that the mickey mouse shirt you're wearing is a, is a great example of that because initially just january 1st right i i you know of course heard everyone talking about it and thought oh i need to jump on this band bandwagon and just posted the the initial illustration and like it did okay like i got it got some views just as a as a graphic post on instagram but it wasn't until disney took it down that it really blew up because then there was more of a story to tell right yeah it's, yeah, it's kind yeah. of um uh, what's that? Barbara Streisand syndrome, I think oh, it's yeah, called, yeah. right? When because, Streisand effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Barbara Streisand effect, yeah. Because Disney um, wanted it taken down, then it's like that. You know, they sort of gave me a story to tell about it, and now I get to like position myself as this, you know, this poor starving artist who's <laughs> <laughs> who's being consumed by the House of Mouse. Yeah. Yes. Is it is it well selling? Uh. Yeah, I mean it's it's selling like better than any of my other t-shirts, but again, yeah, I mean yeah. I've made <laughs> I've made dozens of dollars off of the change. <laughs> no, that's 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 pretty fun though. I mean Yeah, yeah. It's weird though to think that like, you know, there is a there is a world in which, you know, people just might wind up liking you and liking spending time with you and like hearing your commentary or just following your adventures more than your graphic design stuff yeah you know, yeah I, exactly I that's that's something I've, I've sort of um had to reckon with over the years i feel like because yeah part part of me felt like oh no i want to be like this artist i want to be an illustrator i want like to be known for my work and then like sometimes i'm like producing content that has nothing to do with drawing or illustration at all it's just like me like going on a bike ride and talking about my feelings or something like that yeah. and um uh, like par part of me feels like is this cheating because it's a lot easier to just like shoot footage of yourself with your phone than it is to sit down and draw stuff um so i don't know yeah th there's a little bit of like in insecurity around that but i've also at this point maybe just 
come to accept it. Um, that was actually something I was curious about you because you, um, like that's part of your origin story, right? Of you initially aspired to be a political cartoonist and yeah. you've now become much more successful as, as a YouTube content creator. If yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it is kind of weird and it is kind of like the path not pursued in my life. And, you know, there's certain, I think when you get to be older, like I am, you do sort of reflect more backwards and you sort of think of your life as a sort of series of inflection points. And there are, you know, paths not taken. And at some point, like you, I mean, you can always relive your life and we have long lives and there's a lot of times you can reboot yourself and that, but there does start to become a point at which you sort of realize that like, you know, I'm pretty far down one path at, at, at this point. Like I've, I've kind of made my decision in terms of like what my career is going to be. And you know, when I was younger, I really did like cartoons. Like when I was young, like that was the thing that I was known for. Like when I was a kid, I was the kid that was, you know, always drawing and, you know, I would get, I'm sure you were the same way. Like, you know, you get mm -hmm. attention in class for like being the kid that's good at drawing and your friends will ask you to draw things and your projects always have all these drawings in them and your teachers give you compliments for it and all that. Right. So it's yeah. like when you're, when you're young, I feel like you often, when you're young and you're good at drawing, you kind of get sort of slotted into this kind of like artist path, this sort of artist identity. And I took that seriously. And then I thought like, you know, maybe I should go to art school. Like maybe I should become a cartoonist. I used it for a time. I, I was thinking like, I'm going to like work on uh, video games. Like I'm going to be a video game designer. Mm -hmm. I, I eventually had a, uh, a mentor that I was very close with. And he was a, uh, he was a concept artist for uh, video games. And like, I was very sort of seduced by, by that. But then like after 9-11 happened, and this is how old I am, right? Like yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was sort of like very pivotal for me and it like made politics seem more important. And then I started, I, that was when I thought like, well, I can do like political cartoons. I can sort of like combine these sort of like two interests of mine and uh, probably still on some level thought I might be a video game guy, but uh, I still just got more into politics as kind of an end unto itself. And then I started doing more political writing, like for my blog and stuff. And then that got, oh God, more friggin' ambulances. I don't know what's going on here today. But, uh, but you know, like I started getting a lot more attention for my, for my writing than I ever did for my drawings. When I started putting both of them online, it was the writing that got more, more attention than, than the drawings. And then so again, like, you know, the market sort of incentives, you kind of like follow what the people seem to want. And then like through my writing, I got jobs writing for for publications. You know, I got to go on television. Uh, you know, and then I sort of became this kind of like political commentary guy. And you know, at the same time, I went to university and I studied politics and and this kind of stuff. So it just like that. I just was much more uh, like rewarded for my my writing and my ability to be sort of a, a commentator on the political scene than I ever did for my drawing. And then, you know. I, Obviously, I, I made a conscious decision not to go to art school, to go to normal university. And, and then that had a sort of a consequence as well. And I do kind of feel like, you know, if I'm honest, like that my art skills kind of uh, plateaued at some point. Like I didn't continue mm -hmm. to evolve and, and get better and better and better to the point where I could be sort of like competitive at the level that I think a professional artist has to be in this sort of hyper competitive age. So I don't know. It's just like, I still do draw. Like when you watch my videos, there are still, uh, you know, cartoons and stuff in them mm -hmm. from time to time. I still like to draw for its own sake as well. But yeah, it's, 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 it's odd. Like sometimes I look back at my life and it's, it's kind of weird that I am now, I'm now like a professional YouTuber. I'm a professional writer. And I'm like a commentator and like a person that analyzes things and uses my words because like, I don't know, like if you had asked like child JJ or even teenage JJ, he probably would have never guessed that that's how his life would play out. But, you know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, you know, sometimes what we think we have, what we think we have to give the world is very different than what the world wants from us, you know, and you, and I think that it's important though, to be flexible enough to, um, and to be humble enough to sort of follow, uh, you know, the, the requests of others rather than to try to sort of double down on our own sort of, you know, vain fantasies for what we think we are destined to be or what we should be. And, you know, this goes for YouTube as much as anything else. Like there's mm -hmm. people that 
don't have the skills to be good YouTubers, but have convinced themselves that they're going to be a good YouTuber in the same way that you have people that have convinced themselves they're going to be a great, you know, cartoonist or a great singer or a great musician yeah, yeah. or whatever else, but they don't got the skills. So like, who knows? I mean, you're, you're a fine artist and you're a good graphic designer, but there's, who knows what will ultimately, cause you're still relatively young and like, who knows what will ultimately resonate the most with, with the, the public. And that will to some degree decide what your ultimate career will be by the time you're my age. Yeah, I, I resonate so much with that that sense of wistfulness and and longing and th thoughts about what could have been. Um, I yeah, when <laughs> when I was in my late teens, early twenties, I decided to go to Bible college, and uh, oftentimes I I look back and wonder what if I would have gone to art school instead of Bible college. I remember what were you making, gonna What were you going to be at Bible college? Uh, like you know, like a missionary, you know, oh, or yeah. like work for work for a church and do do graphics for God, you know, which I oh, did really? for, for like most of my mid twenties. That was my job was, was I was a graphic designer at a mega church. Oh really? Oh mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, another, another big part of, part of my origin story. That was, that was a big part of like my kind of you know, disillusionment with, with religion and stuff like that. And that's, uh, yeah, some, something I still contemplate to this day is like maybe sort of like the, the corporatization of of Christianity is why I became so disillusioned with it. Um, can I can I ask you just a random question? Like, what sure, what, are, yeah. what is sort of like from a graphic design perspective? Like, what are the aesthetics of the modern sort of American evangelical sort of scene? What are the aesthetics? Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like I've been out of the game for for at least a couple years now. So they maybe they've moved past me, but you know, I mean, a lot of like gradients, a lot of pastels, like, yeah. you know, fo photos of like people raising their hands in worship are, are really nice to come by, yeah. especially if you can get some diversity, you know, some non-white people <laughs> in those photos. Yes. And if, if there, it's a real photo from our church and not a stock photo, that's, you know, that's even better. <laughs> um, like uh yeah it, i always it was it was interesting because um when i was graphic designer i i was making graphics for you know big house which is like the adults and then also like the students and children's um ministries as well like kind of the series graphic packages and everything so it always felt like the the adult graphics were pretty like boring professional like those yes. stock photo based like like i was saying and then like the the students and children's i got to have a lot more fun with because one, there was just like less eyes overseeing it and looking for approval. And also, you know, just like kids, kids enjoy like fun cartoon style stuff. And, and they'd also want more like photography based stuff. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'm just sort of thinking like, you know, I did a video about the rise of sort of evangelicals as oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, a, a fourth mm -hmm. in America. And, you know, obviously part of the story in like, you know, the last 30 years or so has been the evangelicals, you know, trying to adopt more kind of consciously sort of hip uh, aesthetics and hip sort of trends, you know, Christian rock and Christian video games, yeah, and, yeah. you know, novels and, you know, action movies and all this kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was just, I was just kind of like wondering if that kind of that interest in, in doing things that are hip and, and edge uh, like modern and uh, you know, while still being, you know, christ focused but nevertheless kind of like being a little bit more uh in tune with the sort of like this the trends of the secular world but you're sort of framing it as if a, this is like a lot of the aesthetics and sort of the graphic design stuff are still like quite dated and still because like what you're describing mm -hmm. reminds me of like some of the stuff that i saw in the in the church that i went to when i was young like you know just the boring catholic church with like you know stock footage images for like easter and christmas and that kind of stuff Totally. Yeah. We, we were trying, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of like a classic hallmark of, of just like the, the Christian church in general is they're always like a couple years behind the, the culture and stuff like that. And I think of like the, I mean, the church that, that I was at was, it felt like we were so influenced by Hillsong, if you're familiar with, with that church, with just their whole aesthetic and their, their style of music and fashion and the way they did graphic design and everything and it felt like hillsong was probably kind of just following the trends of i don't know like nike and kanye west and like whoever you know yeah. whoever like kind of the 
the big like cultural movers and shakers of the mid 2000s were um yeah yeah it's it's interesting to you know like looking back now on kind of like the more recent like scandals that have come out with with hillsong and to think like the place that i was at we we were not hillsong but we were like envious like we we wish we could be as cool as hillsong oh yeah and uh (laughs) yeah then then it turns out like maybe you know maybe there was some darkness behind all of the the cool skinny jeans and stuff like that yeah because the the big the big the hillsong like the charismatic preacher he was like a young guy with like tattoos and all that right yeah carl lentz yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah. it was justin bieber's yes uh, pastor Yeah, Yeah, yeah yeah Did you, did you, uh, I mean, you probably have a very distinctive look. Did you have that look when you were in your, uh, evangelical arc? Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose so. I mean, I definitely like, held on to the skinny jeans for a long time and, um, I don't know. I mean, I was, I was always a little bit of an outlier from my friends and that I was a little bit more into like the indie folk kind of music as opposed to, uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, like the like the Christian hardcore scene and mm-hmm. like emo music was, was big, like when I was in high school and stuff. And I feel like that really, um, influenced kind of like the fashion and aesthetic of, um, and I, and I guess like a lot of people on staff at the church had probably more of kind of a preppy, um, influence to their style as well. Mm. Um, oh my gosh. Well, th- this is something I wanted to ask you specifically is, um, <laughs> <laughs> how how cringe is it to be a a millennial male who still has a mustache in 2024? <laughs> well, I mean, like as as you know, like I've gone back and forth on the mustache look a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like I don't know. I have I have complex feelings about it. I mean, now now that I'm now that I'm turning 40, I uh, well, increasingly my main priority is like what doesn't make me look old, right? Mm-hmm. And so I feel like just because you can't tell but I have a lot of gray hair. And so when I have a mustache now, like the gray hair in my mustache is much more apparent. So it's like, mm. that is now increasingly becoming a big strike against uh, going back to the mustache look, even though I'll probably will at some point, just because I, I get bored with how I look. And that's why it's like, you know, you seem like, I mean, I, I don't know how long you've been with your current look, but I mean, the fact that your hair is as long as it is suggests that you've been pretty committed to that sort of look for a while. And I definitely believe like that there's something kind of aesthetically uh, pleasing about when you have long hair and you have at least some facial hair because then mm-hmm. it kind of like feels a little balanced, you know, the hair on your head versus the hair on your, your face kind of, it sort of, yeah, it balances out. So I don't know, but the, the hard thing about the, the mustache is just that you just, you become the guy that has the mustache. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah and totally. It's like, I even feel that way. Like sometimes I've, when I had a mustache and I'd be like at a, you know, some sort of trendy restaurant or something. And like the waiter is like serving me and he has a mustache and I'm like, get a load of this guy, like mm-hmm. mustache man over here. Right. So I don't know, but you know, you and I were both pretty eccentric, right? Like you're probably more eccentric than I am, which is saying something, but it's like, I guess you just, I don't know. You have to be able to make peace with being your true self and if your true self is you know with the mustache then you just got to lean into that i mean you lean into your look very you know unapologetically which is cool with your big glasses and all Mm -hmm. of that so i don't know like uh, but i'd be curious like to what degree like even though i'm sure you are bursting with self-confidence and you you're happy with who you are but like to to what degree do you ever feel self-conscious about the way that your look is is kind of constructed and and the way that people will judge you for it right because that's the other thing too is like if you are in any way interesting in this world like there are a lot of people that react with great hostility to it and you know i'm sure that you're on the receiving end of of this kind of hostility as as i often am Bur- bursting with self-confidence. Yeah, that's exactly how I would describe myself, JJ. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hmm, that's a good question. How how to respond to that? Like, uh, do, am I discriminated against towards my look? I mean, well, I mean, not because, necessarily. Yeah. I just said, like, yeah. I mean, you might you you probably have a sort of story that you tell yourself about the degree that your look interacts with the expectations of others and how you know that 
can be a source of resistance. It's obviously like we just talked about before that yeah. uh, when it comes to like attracting clients, there's obviously like a positive aspect because it's like, oh, wow, this kid is so cool and hip. I want him with my thing. But like just mm -hmm. in, your, in the course of your day to day life and relationships with other sorts of people, I mean, perhaps it, you imagine or tell yourself that it plays a different role in how people perceive you and, and deal with you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's something I, I do think about a lot because, yeah, I have I do feel like I've been committed to this look for a while. I mean, I did recently shave off the mustache um, a couple of months ago and just like kind of regretted it immediately and, and grew <laughs> yeah. it back right away, um, you know, which I know you're, you're familiar with that feeling. Yeah. Um, and of course, yeah, the, the hair is a long time coming. I, I suppose I, I get comments from relatives, you know, from time to time. Some people in my family who, who say like, when are you going to get a haircut? <laughs> um, or yeah, I guess sometimes social media comments on, on various platforms, you know, people will say like, what is that? I don't know. I, to, I think like my voice is so, you know, distinctive and grating and garish yeah. that you know, even if I had like a completely clean cut look, I mean, that that's far and away the, the thing I get comments about the most is people, people being very off put by, by the sound of my voice, which, um, you know, of, of course, like when I was younger, I felt very self-conscious about it and at this point I've, I've just decided to sort of embrace it and it's something that i, I could not change on unlike yeah. my my hair and facial hair and glasses like that so i suppose it's it's sort of just the whole package um shout out the the chat is has been completely unhinged for <laughs> for the duration of our conversation lots of talk about jordan peterson i think that's that's the, probably the number one comment I get about the sound of my voice is people saying I sound like Jordan Peterson. Oh, I never thought of that. But yeah, I can I can kind of hear it now. Even though you're not you're not uh, are you are you from the Midwest? Yeah, I'm I'm from Minnesota okay, originally. Yeah, because you have a sort of like Canadian kind of sounding accent, even though mm -hmm. you know I know you're American, so I guess that would track. Yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. that's. <laughs> Yeah, that's been that's been my theory on it is because yeah, to me Jordan Peterson seems to have a very thick Canadian accent co combination of the the Canadian accent with kind of the the high pitched kind of hoarse um, yeah. vocal register, and so I feel like that's that's the same kind of recipe I have. Uh, with it would being be good though. You could do you could do uh, you could do good uh, Jordan Peterson uh, impressions. I'm sure <laughs> that would next when I next someday when I need to get like a, a block quote read in a uh, in a video from Jordan Peterson, I'll get you to uh, to do it. Oh sure, <laughs> but, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, I've. I thought it's about like, that of trying to make like some kind of Jordan Peterson parody account or something like that, but I it never materialized. Yeah. It's it's interesting though because it's like, I mean, I have a you know I have a distinct accent as well, and people are sometimes sort of triggered by it as well. The way I have aboot and aroond and you know pronounced mm. words with the O sound in them, like in a weird yeah. way, in a way that's is off putting to some people, including other Canadians, because my accent is stronger in that way than you know a lot of Canadians you know, want to be. Uh, but the thing is, it's like, what I realized is that there are like layers of things and like, you know, you can sound weird and then you look weird. And then like, you know, like mm. at some point, like it, for some people that reaches a kind of critical mass and it just makes you like so obnoxious that they can't handle you. But then there's some people where it's like the layers of eccentricity or, or uniqueness makes you a very compelling person. And then they're like very intrigued by you. Right. And I feel mm -hmm. like there's, there's lots of, success stories in history of of uh people that have had that kind of like layered eccentricity and then they've been very successful because of it because you know like i don't know for good or bad the world is is all about branding and marketing and your ability to be remembered and all the rest of it so i don't know i think i personally like like people that are eccentric in the way that you are i guess because i'm kind of that way myself but it's uh i don't know it's it's just it's just a, it's an interesting thing to be self-conscious of because one of the things that I think bothers people about it is that they kind of feel like if you're overtly eccentric in your manner that you're like trying to like I don't know like fool people or trick people or or something like that and like mm -hmm. people people like that's like where they get their back up for some reason like they feel like oh look at this guy he's like He's trying to like pretend that this is just like how he rolled out of bed with his big glasses and mustache or whatever. But I yeah, know that yeah. you're trying something. You know, you're yeah, trying to what be... am I compensating for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something. I don't know. It's just it's 
I'm, I'm just, I find it, it's just a really like interesting kind of topic to me. Like I, 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 I was recently like, there's some very, well, not, there's like a prominent like left-wing uh, sort of lawyer in British Columbia where I live. And, you know, she is a lesbian and has like very short uh, hair in a sort of boyish way. But then she also like spells her name with just the lowercase letters. You know, I'm sure you've seen people mm. that have that affectation. Yeah. Mm. And I just remember like, you know, her politics are not my own. But she just like, I remember reading her website once and she just kind of had like a little kind of like uh, explanation of it. And she said like, yeah, I spell my name with my with lowercase letters. And, and she just kind of like had a like sort of brief aside where she said, it's always been amazing to me how like angry people get when someone tries to just be slightly different, even in a way that does not affect their lives in any way. Like the amount of hostility that that can provoke. And I just, that for some reason, like really resonated with me. Like just the idea that hmm. when people are just a little bit different, even in ways that like do not affect your life at all, like there's a, the, the public or like some segment of the public will just be angry and threatened by that. So it's, mm -hmm. It's, it's, and unfortunately, like, as you become, if you become more famous on YouTube or whatever, yeah. you know, there becomes more of that, but then there also becomes, like I said, there also becomes more people that, that, you know, love you for it. So, yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I think it's kind of like fun to kind of play around with or like lean into the eccentricities and especially like when it comes to the idea of sort of like building out a brand, like you were mentioning earlier, I have this, this minimalistic, um, like design sense and I, I think that's true of like i i try to um like i wear the same outfit every day i wear like a brown t-shirt and green pants every day and that's been like kind of I an know. experiment i've been i've been trying for the past couple years because I, you know, I remember reading all those articles about how like steve jobs wore the same outfit every day and that's why he was such a genius or whatever and obama too did you have you heard that about obama he only had like three suits because oh. he said like he wanted to like seen obama yeah yeah he said he said something like yeah, he only had like three suits and like his official rationalization for that was like, you know, the president has to make a million decisions a day. I want to save my like decision making power for like the important yeah, stuff. I yeah. don't want to be like stressing out about what tie to wear in the morning or whatever. So that was that was something that I wanted I really wanted to investigate and sort of call call BS on was the decision fatigue thing. Oh yeah. To, to me, I always thought like that that seems a little bit of a stretch. Like like for me, I feel like the the benefit of wearing the same outfit every day is sort of like the the brand recognition thing of just kind of the fun of being like this this is my bit or this is my aesthetic yeah. the fun of being committed to the bit um i would say versus like the decision fatigue i don't know like there's so many other things in my life that seem like way more difficult to make decisions <laughs> about than like which t-shirt am i gonna wear it's 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 interesting though because i was actually talking about this with with my friend uh the other day like like, like communication to me is like the most important thing. And like, that's like the value that I kind of like revolve my life around. And I was sort of like having this kind of like vague thesis that people that are good at communication in one realm are generally pretty good at communication in multiple realms. And so, you know, the fact, or, or I should say, no, I'll put a finer point on it, is that people's communication style is generally consistent across the many different ways that they communicate, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the fact that you sort of dress in a kind of plain, repetitive, simple style, mm -hmm. that tracks because your art is also, you know, plain yeah. and, well, not plain, but it's like, you know, it's it's simple and like efficient and to the point, Right. And I feel like your videos are that way too. Like you speak and you narrate in a very direct kind of matter of fact sort of way. So whereas like I find that some artists who have like a very Baroque or complex style, they often, you know, perhaps they speak in a similarly kind of like complex way. Hmm. You know, they're, they're not as efficient of a communicator. Um, and, you know, I think it's the same, the same thing. Like I find that like I like... I like writing in a very simple, direct way. I'm very drawn to books that are written in a very direct, you know, minimalistic sort of Hemingway-esque kind of prose. But then yeah. like people, and then as a result, I'm like, I'm attracted to minimalistic sort of efficient, simplistic art as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas then like a lot of people that like the very Baroque style of writing also like very detailed art as well. Like they'd be more inclined to like, like super photorealistic renderings of, you know, 
as opposed to just sort of like minimalistic line art and that kind of stuff. So does that does that does that theory track with you? Yeah, it it does track. I think I think that's probably a big part of why I was so like compelled by your videos in the first place when I first discovered your YouTube channel a couple of years ago. Something about the way that your style of delivering information is is very direct and simple and even like the way you insert kind of the the lo-fi video game sound effects and, oh, yeah. and things in there it's there's something about it that's like it's almost like a bullet point style like when you mm -hmm. when you just fill the screen with with color and the title card it's like here we're on to the next point here and there's something very neat and organized about it that that i found very appealing nice aesthetically nice. yeah that's well, that's awesome. That's a great, that's a great compliment. What, when you, when you think of like the artists that you like or have been big influence on you, are they mm -hmm. generally pretty simple or like or similar in style to the, the kind of style that you try to have? Yeah, I, I think so. I've thought about that a lot with, um, with my drawing style, because like, I, I feel like yeah, even though I've been drawing all my life and I'm 33 years old, I, I do still feel like I have kind of this very simplistic kind of sketchbook like amateurish style and i really like seeing that in other people's art as well i mean like like daniel johnston is a great example of there's something that's just so beautiful about his kind of childlike way of drawing things and you know like when you see a, a logo kind of get like sketchbookified or something like that oh, yes. um I, to, to me that always seems like really really cool and exciting and and as i as I thought about it, I thought like maybe the reason I like am attracted to those kind of lo-fi um, aesthetics is because it feels achievable, you know, like when you see like mm. a really simple but really cool like sketchbook style drawing, and at least for me, I'm, I have this feeling of like, oh yeah, I could make something like that. And that's <laughs> yeah. exciting to me versus like if I go to an art museum and see like a beautiful Baroque painting, you know, I know for sure I could never achieve that so you know mm. yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a that's a good insight i think yeah i think i feel that way as well like the yeah it, that's a that's you know that's a very good insight that it's achievable like it's, it's, achievable. it's within what's in within grasp and maybe I, I sometimes think about this as well like to what degree am i self-rationalizing right mm -hmm. so it's like mm -hmm. I, like I said earlier, right? Like, I think that my art skills have kind of plateaued and I'm, you know, it's, it's harder for me to learn and I don't have the time or, you know, attention span to get as good as being a technical, you know, artist as I, as I, as you know, maybe I could in a different life. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, that makes me kind of like rationalize the style that I currently have mastered. Right. And because like, I'm currently most comfortable drawing in a sort of simplistic, minimalistic kind of style you know, with, with solid lines and flat colors and all that, I kind of have to like come up with a high minded theory of why this is actually the best way to draw. But, you know, on the other hand, it's just like, I, I do think that there, do you know, like Al Hirschfeld, the famous uh, New Yorker cartoonist? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's like one of my greatest, I think, influences, or at least one of the artists I most admire, because to me, like, there's just something so, so like he did these great caricatures in the New York times and the New Yorker mm -hmm. for many years. And it's just like, to me, there's like something just, just like so magical about his art and the way that he can capture like such a recognizable essence of a person with mm -hmm. such a minimal amount of lines. And to me, like that will just always be more impressive than someone who can create a, you know, full size oil painting of somebody and capture their likeness. Right. Cause it's just, it's, it, and it go, and again, it goes to like, you know, making short form content or anything like that, like, or writing a good newspaper article that only takes 750 words, but just like every sentence is just so packed with meaning and so purposeful. Like I just, there's something about that. Like there's just something about like having to do more with less that I feel like is the truest kind of like essence of the artist. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. This is reminding me of something else I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Do you have any of that AI art anxiety? Do you feel at all, at all threatened by you, yeah, you, you I mean, being replaced not, by artificial intelligence? Not as much for like me personally, just because like art is not that big a part of my life where I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I have much to like literally fear by it. I do feel kind of like bad on behalf of other artists because even though I think that AI has a lot of problems and, you know, like it's it's not, you know, it's not the best. But there is like, I'm sure you feel this way as well. Like there is a lot of kind of like mid 
tier kind of art that feels like it's kind of getting a little bit displaced by it in a very real way mm -hmm. where I see like when I'm just scrolling blindly through Instagram or whatever, and you know, sometimes something will come up and I don't really know if it's AI or not. And right. on some level it almost kind of doesn't matter because the thing that that art exist to communicate is relatively sort of like simple and trivial right so like a classic example is like i'm very obsessed with these kind of like lo-fi chill relax beat you know videos oh yeah you know, like uh -huh. the one I, I sent you one the other day right of like the 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 chill music while the van is like yeah you well know, it's raining outside well, it's raining and yeah. like you see the water through the window and it's very cozy like i love those kind of videos i put them on in the background when i'm working and i like to like just kind of like casually like look at the cozy vibes you know and it's like you know, somebody at one time made a lot of those pictures of those kind of cozy vibes. Mm -hmm. Now that kind of art is very easily made by AI. It's not like high art. It's not great art. Like it, it captures a mood. It captures a spirit. But the art is just, you know, it's kind of, I don't know how to describe it exactly. Like it's it's just like it's it's art that doesn't have a great a very high aspiration of what it seeks to do. And so as a result, it feels like that is the kind of art that on some level, like it makes sense to me that that would be sort of mechanized away. But that's also, it also kind of feels that something about that does feel a little grim and feels a little sad that there are probably artists that can make it better than the AI can make it or, mm -hmm. you know, in, but the, the sort of subtle distinctions do seem quite small, but you know, but that's like that, is an example of a realm of art that I think is kind of being automated away. But you know, like the kind of art that like you do, for example, I feel like is is just qualitatively different and just like exists for a different purpose. And is because it is particularly like when you're doing like client work and stuff like that, like it mm -hmm. it has to be very precise and 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 that is definitely something that like AI art is not good at doing. Like it it can capture like broad move, broad moods, broad vibes, and all that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, broad brush strokes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know what mm. is what is your sort of thinking about this? That, no, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about like sometimes clients reaching out to me because they feel like they know me personally because I'm putting myself on camera and doing videos, and then yes. you know wanting to hire me to do graphic design, which is sort of unrelated to like whether or not they know yeah. me as a person but th that is something i've thought about a lot over the past couple of years with kind of the rise of of mid journey and dolly and all of that is maybe there's something strategic about like trying to put myself and my personality out there so that people will be incentivized to want to hire me as a person versus mm -hmm. wanting to hire like a, a faceless machine that can yeah. do stuff that's better than i can do faster cheaper stronger better yeah have you have you felt that though like have you have you been because i know like there was a time when like artists would really be on their high horse about how like ai art will never fool me and like i can always tell and this kind of thing like do you yeah. are you finding yourself more fooled by by ai art uh yeah i think so i mean i'm, yeah. I'm sure there's been all kinds of ai art that has passed me by without me recognizing that it was right i mean kind of by definition, it's like what the toupee fallacy, right? Like you only spot the toupees that that are bad toupees. You don't spot oh, yeah. the ones that when people get away with it. So I feel like it's probably the same thing with our. I remember when that that viral picture of the Pope in his puffy jacket. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I fell for it immediately, and wasn't oh, until yeah. like later that I like realized other people were pointing out that his fingers are wrong and stuff yeah. like that. And of course, like it's it's only going to get better as as we move into the future. Yeah. Um, and I've even thought about that of like, um, cause a lot of people will, will say like, oh yeah, AI art, they can do this kind of like, you know, wishy-washy kind of broad stroke style that, that you're talking about. Um, but, but it can't kind of replicate kind of the human sketchbooky, um, like yeah. hard line style, which, which I think is true for now, but I don't think that yeah. will be true forever. Right. It's just like, to me, that seems like a really dumb argument to say like, oh yeah, AI, they can't even get hands and fingers yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. It's like, of course, all of that is going to get like yeah, fixed yeah. in the wash. It's just, it's just, I guess it's just like the communication sort of side of things. Like being able to clearly communicate with an artist what you want or, mm -hmm. or like if yeah. you want to get it sort of touched up in a specific way or like, you know, you want to have like a bunch of different 
uh, sort of options to pick from and like you know you kind of just give the in like i don't know i just kind of feel like the way that humans communicate with other humans will always be a great advantage for the human artist and mm -hmm. Because it's like the machine, like the machine does not understand, like the machine does not have a yeah. brain, like it cannot think and conceptualize these kinds of things. It can just kind of like spit out in reaction to prompts, you know, whatever connections that it's making between words and its language model and all that kind of thing. And I, I do think that there will all probably always be limitations on that. Like if we are going to believe that the capacity for thought is a significant sort of distinction that humans have and machines don't. Then I think we have to have some faith that uh, that a thinking artist will always have some advantage over an unthinking machine, no matter how like technically skilled in the sort of the technical sense of art the machine is. It's just like the ability to like actually understand what is being created. I think is 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 something that we cannot minimize. Hmm. I don't know, but then do artists even understand their own work? Right? Like, isn't that always like the most interesting thing when? when an artist like writes the lyrics and they say like, I don't even know where these lyrics came from. And then they turn out to be like this prophecy that's fulfilled like five years later. I guess that's true. I guess maybe I've just been sort of thinking, like I was sort of thinking in, in the, from like the perspective of, of like a working artist, right? Like an artist that has like a client and sort of like the relationship with the client sort of, and mm -hmm. you know, they're making art in a very sort of purposeful way in that sense, very utilitarian sort of functional sort of way. Whereas yeah. like, no, but I think it's, I think it's true. It's like, you know, the AI machines will be able to just produce things that are very imaginative, right. And very creative and, and expressive. And, and that stuff will, I think, be very captivating to a lot of people, even though it is, you know, literally thoughtless, like it, yeah. we humans will then project our own sort of meaning onto the art that has been created. And that will be sort of like interesting. Right. You know, I, I, it's, it's interesting because I remember at one point when I was like talking about AI art and I, I think I put a poll on my Instagram or something of like, do you, what, what are your thoughts on AI art? And one person commented something to the effect of like, the thing about AI art is it's boring. Mm. And I, I mean, I totally disagree with that. I feel like, you know, the yeah. fact that a machine can produce this, like that's deeply interesting. Like maybe it's kind of a novelty thing and like, you know, it's, it's, it's so much more normalized now than it was a year ago, of course. So it's just going to be something we take for granted as we move into the future. But I don't know, like that kind of like Blade Runner-y thing, like when a machine seems to feel emotions, but you know intellectually the machines don't feel emotions. Like, yeah. I don't know. T to me, I feel like that's that's a very interesting thing to consider. Yeah. No, I agree. It's It's definitely a bold new sort of frontier in, in the culture that... Uh... I don't know, like, I, I, I guess, like, I'm always a little skeptical of everything. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. skeptical of sort of radical change in any form. Um, but I think, yeah, it, I, I probably leaned on the side of like, under, I mean, it's, it's remarkable, like, just how this has happened, like, just when like, <laughs> slightly over a year, this whole sort yeah. of like cultural phenomenon has just sort of exploded. And I kind of feel like, Initially, maybe I was more skeptical than was justifiable, but I mm. still think that now I think it's just like, what is like the right amount of skepticism? Because I think it's always healthy to be skeptical of some things. And I don't know, I just, yeah. I think it's, it's possible that the technology will continue to get better, but for one reason or another, it will not be like completely dominant over everything, right? Because it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like human technology evolves in weird ways. Like, it's someday it's going to be weird. Like imagine like talking to the grandchildren or the great grandchildren about like life in, in 2024. And then you sort of like, for example, like newspapers, right? You sort of say like, oh, we still had paper newspapers in 2024. And then the kids will be like, well, why? You had the internet, didn't you? Why would there still paper newspapers? And so, well, you know, yeah. we just still had them and some people like them, you know? So it's like, I think it's possible that like AI art will be very good and be very, you know, accessible technology, but a lot of people will still just not use it for reasons that maybe aren't completely rational or justifiable, but just because we're just more used to dealing with human artists. And that's just like, easier and humans have a bias towards things that they're used to yeah. i don't know I, I i think there's a lot of truth to that yeah i i certainly was a much more in a state of despair a, a year ago or whenever when when it first became a, a big new thing and i just 100 percent just felt like wow i do not have a future here like i'm 
I'm going the way of the dodo. Uh. And I don't know, you know, it, th that might still <laughs> prove to be true, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel as depressed about it now as I did. Again, maybe just because it's become normalized at this point. But. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Like, I feel like I haven't yet, uh, I haven't heard like a lot of stories of like artists actively, you know, losing work because mm -hmm. of the, yeah, I mean, same. Are coming, but I don't know. Sure, same. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah, to me, I don't personally feel like I've lost it. But again, like it, it's totally possible that there's you know there's people who like would have reached out to someone like me, but then they discovered they can just do it themselves. I don't know. I mean, as, with with graphic design, also like it's not even AI, but just like the way that Canva has just made it so like anyone can do just a rudimentary slide layout you know that that was something that i used to you know show up to work and get a salary for was doing the type of gr just laying text over images type of graphic design that you know like your mm. grandma could do now so mm. yeah do you have you have you found a use for ai yourself I, I don't feel i'm not sure that i've used it for anything like really practical it's mostly just been kind of like messing around with it just for fun um, maybe a couple of times I've used it, like just to, to produce assets, you know, like rather than finding a stock photo, I'll, I'll use it to produce an asset and, you know, in Photoshop or something like that. Mm. Um, I don't know. I've, yeah, I've used it to, I've used, uh, chat GPT to write cover letters a couple of times for like different <laughs> interviews, which I mean, I haven't <laughs> heard back from, so, so maybe, yeah. that, maybe that didn't <laughs> work out for me. I, yeah what about what about you have you found a way to use it like practically to speed up your work not, not really just because i still think that there is a, a like as the technology currently exists i think that there's just is a like a real problem with it being able to really understand what you're trying to tell it to do and so like even a lot of times where like i've thought i could use it just to make relatively simple assets i still wind up just going to get stock footage or just yeah, download yeah. things from deposit photos, which is like the stock footage site I use just because it's easier because I'll say like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, Dolly, like make me a hot dog on a white background. And like yeah. the hot, like they'll, it'll just do something wrong. Like there'll be blueberries yeah. on the hot dog for no reason. And then I'll just say no blueberries on the hot dog. And then like the bun comes out and it's like bright orange or something or like, it's just like, and it's just frustrating to like have to wrestle with it to just try sure. to get something that's like, almost good enough when still the stock footage route seems easier and ch like chat gpt i just find is useless as far as facts go mm -hmm. um but it can sometimes be a little bit useful for brainstorming so sometimes i'll because i do a lot of stuff in in the kind of content that i make that requires like lists of examples of things and sometimes like when I'm having a hard time thinking of a list of examples of things, I'll ask ChatGPT. And it's like, I feel like a lot of the times, like 80% of the examples it gives are just wrong. But mm. maybe like once in a while, there'll be something in that list of examples that will like, so like, here's an example, right? Like I'm actually, I'm doing this drawing right now of like things from the Chinese Zodiac, uh, sort of as embodied by pop culture objects. Like this mm -hmm. is just a drawing I'm doing for fun. And then I was trying to think like, well, what's a pop culture object from a snake? And then, and so I asked ChatGPT, what are some po pop common sort of objects that involve snakes? And like most of the answers are just complete garbage. It's just like snake jewelry, snake cup, snake toys, you know, snake t-shirt. But then mm -hmm. one of them said snake board game. And then I was thinking like, oh, snakes and ladders. Snakes That's and ladders, thing, yeah. Right? So it's like, it didn't directly tell me it, but it's like just the stream of nonsense nevertheless like inspired thoughts in me that were useful and so in that sense i find it can be helpful for just like just a tool in, in sort of getting the creative juices flowing a bit even if it doesn't replace you know your own creativity totally um all right as i said the, the chat has been completely unhinged i'll bring up this one comment from bubble tea that i think is a very all like right. on to on topic so thank okay. you bubble team a art ai art can do that sketchbook style or any style with imperfections it's just that mid-journey especially thinks a certain style is most desired and ideal and so ai art looks samey mm. i i think that that might be true or yeah. at least it'll be it's true i believe that like in the future it'll just be able to replicate more and more styles and because yeah i, I agree there is like 
when when we think of stereotypical AI or AI art, it does have kind of this kind of waxy, plasticky aesthetic yeah. to it. Um, too 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 colorful, mm -hmm. too smooth, and too like soft focus light like the lighting in ai art is always of a very specific sort and yeah 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 and i think that comes from the way it's produced from i, I don't i remember seeing like process videos how it starts it starts basically like with very simple like blobby out of focus shapes and then just like heightens and like crunches it down and get, tries to tries to get it to like more solid objects and that's why when you look at the small details they can be off in that way interesting yeah yeah uh, um, it, it tracks. I mean, the thing yeah. I the thing that I'm always interested in is sort of like where the kind of like the emergence of like new cliches. And I do mm -hmm. wonder if uh, if like that kind of like blobby, like weirdly lit style will persist in the culture as like the kind of the stereotype of what AI. Are. Right, right. When people make period movies about the, yes. the year 2022 or something like that. Yeah. Or, or even like just like, like the degree to which we still think of like video games, like we associate them with like pixels, right? Like sprites mm -hmm. and stuff, even though we've like moved away from that technology decades ago, it still lingers in the popular imagination. And I don't know, that's just, uh, it can work, right. it can work against it. Like that can work against it too, right? Like first impressions are important. And if AI art makes a bad first impression, a lot of people like their stereotypes of it might sort of solidify and you know that i suppose can work to the human artist's advantage a bit yeah and i suppose it, it is it's the imperfections that make it distinct i suppose like the way people are nostalgic for vinyl records having all of the scratches and pops and mm. like vhs having like the tracking glitches and stuff when you know like now we feel sentimental about those things and we'll implement them into modern design but Back in the day, of course, like the VHS tips were trying to achieve the highest fidelity possible. Like they were trying to avoid the the tracking glitches, but yes. yeah, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I don't know where, I don't know how we're, <laughs> how you're doing on time here. I, I, I did want to ask you one more yeah. specific question yeah. uh, on a different topic because, um, I remember, uh, when I first discovered you and I was binging through your your YouTube videos, you had this, I think it was a video about middle class culture, if I remember right. And you mm. said something about consumerism. Mm. And I don't remember specifically what you said, but I thought it was so notable of you seem to be like, maybe the only person I've ever encountered in my life who used the term consumerism <laughs> as not as a derogatory term. Yeah. And um, it's something I'm fascinated by because, uh, you know, recently just decided to get rid of all my stuff and move into a van and like we talked about with like wearing the same outfit every day yes. that's something that i like think about all the time and been sort of try, trying to be obsessive about like avoiding consumerism or being being a non-materialistic person yeah um so i don't know just curious about your your thoughts on that as someone who's on the opposite end of that spectrum yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like one of like the f really one of the first things that I remember feeling like in a sort of political way with any great deal of conviction was that like I was pro consumerism, right? Like, because I, I just kind of had like when I was in college, especially and when I was studying communications and stuff. And I just remember, you know, really sort of feeling like I was being fed a relentless kind of like stream of anti consumerist propaganda. And it's just like, you should hate consumerism. You should hate owning things. You should hate materialism. You should hate that there's advertising and shopping and malls and, you mm -hmm. know, all this kind of stuff. Like, I feel like, you know, and some of that is kind of like bound up in a kind of like anti-capitalist kind of uh, mm -hmm. perspective that you tend to hear a lot in, in college. But also, like, I mean, I just kind of feel like that is in some ways like our society's default disposition, that people are always feeling bad that they like things or that they buy things and that you know that they have too much stuff and that we should look down on somebody who likes having things and likes going shopping and and i, I don't know like it just always like it struck me i'm very sensitive to like problems of self-loathing which i think are very mm. can be quite destructive right in the yeah, same way yeah. that we're supposed to have self-esteem for ourselves I think it's important that we have some degree of pride in the society that we inhabit, you know, which is broadly good, you know, Canada and America, mm -hmm. we've got our problems, but I think that we are in many ways, like living at the pinnacle of, of, you know, what uh, humankind has thus produced as far as like comfort and, you know, 
all of that goes. Like we live happy, safe, fulfilling, very entertaining lives, right? Like there's a lot to be grateful for in our society. And, and the fact is, is that, you know, a lot of our modern society has been built on consumerism. And obviously there's been downsides to consumerism, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, certainly the environmental impacts of consumerism are nothing to sneeze at. And, you know, and people can obviously retreat into lives of materialism that alienate them from other people. But I do think that that stuff is part of the story. It is not the entirety of the story. And I, I just get a little bit tired of people only telling stories that sort of demonize the consumerism of our society without talking about the many ways in which it, you know, owning things, buying things, shopping, identifying with brands and all the rest of this kind of stuff like brings a lot of people joy. It helps them build identities. It helps them make connections with other people, liking the same sort of things, doing communal activities like buying stuff together and being excited about what you bought and having collections. You know, obviously I'm a big collecting type of guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, sorry. Uh, I, I'm just saying, yeah, just agreeing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I mean like being pleased with like your, your, your clothes that you own or, you know, the car that you have, like there's just like a lot of things like this that I think are not inherently toxic or negative things. And I, th I think that, you know, we live in a society where people are just really stressed a lot and people are really depressed a lot. And I think that there's just like this kind of like error that just kind of this miasma that just like, no matter what you're doing, you're always doing something wrong, right? And I think that it's it's helpful if, if we have some voices pushing against that endless refrain that say like, no, some of the things you're doing are fine. It's okay. Like you can like your things. You can like that you've got a house full of material objects that you bought with your money and, and bring you pleasure. You don't need to feel endlessly guilty and ashamed of this. And I think that if we're going to have any sort of, like if we're going to stay together as a functional civilization, we have to be able to have some degree of, you know, satisfaction in, in what we've achieved, you know? So I don't know. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's just kind of what I feel. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's a reflection of my own kind of like inherently sort of secular disposition on these sorts of things you know i didn't grow up in a in a very religious kind of milieu so i guess i've been more inclined to sort of think about life in a kind of like worldly sort of way where it's mm -hmm. like the world that we live in now is the world that we've is the only one we've got so we better make the most of it and try to maximize our joy within it but you know there's other people that i think you know perhaps people that are a little bit more spiritual either in a strictly religious way or in a kind of more transcendental sort of way Mm -hmm. who are inclined to see like the world that we inhabit is sort of defined by wickedness and sinfulness and you know that it's a world that we should be endlessly ashamed of and seek to atone for its wickedness and i guess that's just never really been how i come at the at the perspective like i've always been i've always sort of thought of myself as being a sort of like a small c kind of conservatively dis disposed person and that sort of conservatism is a conservatism of, of gratitude and appreciation and, and defensiveness for what exists Beautifully spoken, JJ. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, again, like I, I feel like this this kind of like fixation on um, on being a non materialistic person is something that I've I don't know like been doing a lot of self examination on recently because I do feel like it's a little bit of a toxic, pretentious um, attribute of myself, and especially like all of your talk about we have this propensity for self loathing. I think mm. that I think that that's something that. <laughs> that I need to be more more self-aware of or I just need to like come to grips with the fact that like self-loathing is not a virtue and it's it's okay to just be content with, with yeah your life. yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. god yeah I, man I wish more people felt that way right because it's yeah people do think it's like somehow I mean this is you know it's just I made the whole video about like Americans hating America, right? Like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like I was making that point, like not in the kind of like cliche right wing kind of Fox News kind of way. But it's just like I really love America. Like America is the civilization that Canada is part of, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And yet whenever I spend any time in the United States and when I consume, you know, the media that's coming out of America, which is the media that we all consume, uh, it's just like the relentless pessimism that I think defines American culture is really quite upsetting that just like everybody is just told, like it doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left or wherever you are, it's just like the culture is just increasingly defined by 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 this kind of spirit of, of self-loathing and feeling upset and depressed and being endlessly critical of everything and then just being so 
doom and gloom and, and miserable. And, you know, and I think that that, yeah, that manifests at the individual level too. It's just like, we're always, we're always failing. Like we're just never living up to some idealized sort of utopian vision of what we're supposed to be and what the society is supposed to be and all that. And so, you know, I do like, I'm, I'm into like mentoring and stuff with like younger people and stuff. And, and truly like one of the things that I just think matters the most is for people to just develop more, 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 more self-esteem and just appreciate things, right? Like there's just so much that we have to be grateful for in this world that we inhabit. Right. So I don't know, just, we need to, we need to just find ways to just look around and say like, you know, this is, this is, this is pretty good. I've got a lot of really great things and I'm very lucky to be living in America in the year 2024. Like I could be doing a lot worse than this. So. Mm -hmm. Man, I, th I think that's, that's really, really beautifully spoken. And, uh, yeah, I, again, like I feel convicted by it as someone who, who feels um, s something of a propensity towards self-loathing and self-criticism with everything. Do you think the self-loathing phenomenon is kind of unique to our times and our culture, or do you think it's just always been a part of the human condition? I think it is relatively unique to our time and our culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I think it's kind of easy to assume that every bad thing is also universal. And I think that, you know, sometimes that's not a very helpful frame. Uh, you know, I'm very interested in, in sort of like mid-century America, like America at, right after World War II. And I'm also interested in sort of like late kind of like Victorian uh, Anglo-American culture as well. You know, a lot of the society that we inhabit today, I believe, comes out of cultural innovations that were made in those two very distinctive periods, you know, sort of like the 1860s to the 1890s, and then like the 1950s to the 1970s. And I think that in many ways, like those were also eras of great sort of self uh, satisfaction and, and pride and self confidence, you know, culturally speaking, obviously, there was lots of social problems that shouldn't be ignored. But they were on the whole like at eras of, of relative optimism and, and sort of an upbeat spirit in which people were like proud to be American. And there was a kind of sense that like, we can do anything and we're doing all this great stuff and look at all this abundance that we have and, and all that. And, and I do think that that has been lost and, and, and you, it's, it just feels like it's, it's tracked. You can just find it on a whole host of metrics. Like the fact that uh, when you poll Americans, they think that this the economy has never been worse than it is now. Like just everything mm. is so terrible. You know, poll numbers suggest that Joe Biden is considered the worst president in American history. And like there's just like there's a whole host of metrics that you can look at and you can just sort of say like objectively like this is just not so like things are not this bad. And you have to say like, well, why? Why do people feel so gloomy and so miserable? And, and, you know, and people's, again, like in people's individual sort of uh, feelings of themselves, like, you know, depression is at very high rates and the degree that people say that, like, I'm not happy with the way my life is going and stuff like this are at very high rates. And so that it, that it does feel distinctive. And, and I feel like one of the, the easiest explanations is just that, you know, that kind of attitude is incentivized by the culture now. Like we live in a culture in which if you are pessimistic and you are sour and you are sort of doom and gloomy, like you get social cachet for being that way. Like that comes off as being the enlightened and, uh, you know, a sort of appropriate sort of sophisticated disposition. Whereas mm -hmm. if you are positive and upbeat and grateful for things around you, you know, then then that comes off as being, I don't know, conceited or naive or having your head in the sand or whatever else. So I don't know. It's just, there's something, there's something healthier that needs to be found here. But the problem is that there's very, it's very hard to find voices in the culture today that I think are making the case for, for sort of positive uh, engagement with, with yourselves or, or, or the culture or the, the, the civilization as a whole. So I guess in my small way, that's something that I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, th I think you, I think you truly, this sounds cheesy to say, but I think you are making the world a brighter place with oh, the, <laughs> the videos you produce. Oh, thank you I so agree much. with this commenter. JJ is very well-spoken. Oh, well, thank you. Somebody was uh, saying to me the other day that like, like, and, and one of my other, one of my live streams, somebody said that like, I speak in this very like formal way. And that like made me like very self-conscious. He said like, oh, JJ, you don't use like very much slang and stuff like that. And I'm just kind of thinking like, oh, is that like another, 
another weird thing. Do you think I speak in a very formal way? Uh, I do. Yeah. I think that yeah. goes back to what we were talking about of like the kind of a very simple, straightforward, very mm. matter of fact way of speaking. And I think um, there's, there's, there's sort of a sense of humor about it. Like I think one, one of my favorite things about your videos is whenever you talk about like, like Bush senior and you say the old man Bush, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not sure if that's meant as a joke, but it, it always makes me chuckle. Uh, <laughs> But I just sort of like... something my, my father used to always say, like, oh, he'd really? always like refer to the, the old man Bush or like, you know, the, the old man Trudeau as opposed to the current Trudeau. Is just right, like, right. I, I really yeah, like It doesn't that just apply to Bush, but other, yeah, other people who are seniors who have juniors. Yeah. 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 The, old, the old man. Yeah. Or just like my friend's dads, you'd always be like, oh, the old man says that he wants to blah, 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 blah. Like, it's just never. <laughs> yeah. This just language is fun, though. It's like there's just like a lot of like fun turns of phrase that you can use and. The, um, yeah. you know, do you know Moist Critical, that YouTube channel? Moist Critical? No, I don't. Oh, he's very, very popular, like commentary guy. He's got like long hair. He's actually an interesting character because he, he, uh, he's a really good commentator. He's very funny, very witty. He always wears the same thing. He has like long black hair, a beard, always wears a white shirt, a black baseball cap. And mm. he has just like a really, like one of the reasons why he's so popular, he's very eloquent. And he just has a real like fun way with words. Like he just uses like lots of like fun, quirky expressions. A lot of times like old fashioned sort of turns of phrase. Like he'll say yeah, like, yeah. you know what's really got my my uh, bunions in a boil or whatever, like that kind of thing, right? Like that that people go for. So I don't know. Language, language is, is important. It's one of the many ways that we we build identities for ourselves. Yeah, I I agree. That's something that I like am, am constantly self conscious about. Of like, I want to be, I want to like expand my vocabulary and have more precise and sharp language. Because I, whenever I like read a book or listen to a podcast or something, and I hear someone speak and have have just this really kind of eccentric choice of word, mm. I always feel envious of them and feel like I yeah. wish I could talk that way. I recently like downloaded an app on my phone that was you know like just randomly gives you vocab words oh, yes. to memorize. So I've been <clears throat> I, yeah. working towards that. Yeah. I, I always feel self-conscious about that as well. Like I always feel like my vocabulary is not big enough and I listen to other people in interviews and read books and stuff. And I'm just always so blown away by the eloquence. Do you feel that way about art? Like this is actually an interesting question because like I'm often very just self-conscious that there's just like so many things I can't draw and I, again, like what we talked about earlier, like sort of like the path not taken in my life, you know, I could have been an artist, gone to art school and continue to advance my skills, but instead they've kind of plateaued and mm -hmm. I can draw what I like to draw and I'm happy with the things that I can draw, but I also like know that there's a lot of stuff that I can't draw. And that sometimes does make me a little, little self-conscious. Do you feel that way very often? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I feel like art envy for... <laughs> I mean, literally everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think about that, like when I watch, um, especially like animated movies, you know, especially uh, like the Into the Spider-Verse oh, movies yeah, yeah. and the, the new Teenage Mutant, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie or like Hayao Miyazaki animated films where they're just so lush and, and well drawn. And I think like I literally could not produce something that's as good as one single frame of mm. this two hour movie. Mm. And uh yeah, it's it's crushing, you know, not to be self-loathing, but well, do you do you get frustrated when you're drawing and you can't draw something? Oh like yeah, of course. Something? It's yeah. it's terrible. Yeah, it, it makes me feel like a like an incompetent child. Yeah, it's awful. I wonder. I, I wonder like how universal that feeling is because it's like mm -hmm. I don't know. That's because I mean, like this is this is sort of like the case against self-loathing in some ways. It's a very sort of like cliched thing to say, mm -hmm. but it, it's just like when Einstein says, like, "Don't worry about your problems with mathematics. I assure you, mine are greater." Right? Like that. Mm -hmm. No matter how high you rise, like there's always going to be some degree of self-loathing because there's always some higher standard that you can compare yourself to. So I wonder if like even the people that are making Into the Spider Verse, you know, they look at it and they're like, oh, there's so many problems with this. This will never be, you know, Walt Disney's Pinocchio or whatever. So sure, yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I think that's that's sort of the imposter syndrome type thing, right? Of like, uh, we feel like we the creative people can feel like they're getting away with something. Of like, this yeah. client thinks yeah. that I'm like a real graphic designer, so like 
maybe I can turn something in that passes for a real graphic design and pull it <laughs> off, but I can't fool them forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think I think it's really just like you know, again, this is another sort of cliche, but it's like just being the best version of yourself and just having like you know realistic. Like, I guess it's it's sort of like, and I feel like this is the case in sort of like the business world. So you probably know this better than than I do, right? It's like, what is your like competitive advantage, right? Like, hmm. like only mm -hmm. you can be you. So just like be the most you, you, you can be, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like you is what um, uh, Dr. Seuss said, right? What's he say? He said something about you're the you -iest you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was ever you. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's like, and it's, it's like, I, I feel this way because it's like, you can sort of be it can feel unambitious on some, on some level, mm -hmm. like to just, because you kind of feel like if I'm the you you, <laughs> you know, then that means I'm not going to be anything else ever. Right. And that like, I somehow just kind of like have to resign myself to just doing what I do and not getting better or being better, or sort of expanding my skills or whatever. So it is kind of, it does sometimes feel a little paradoxical because you know, the argument sort of like against, I guess, growth and advancement in, in art and, and style and all of that is that it perhaps runs the danger of like taking you further away from what you, you know, what you used to be and what once made you distinctive, mm. right? Like I, I sometimes yeah. think that like, even, like you think of that as a, like a thought exercise. Like if I could wave a magic wand and just be like a super talented technical artist and I could like render a photorealistic like picture of someone's face or whatever, mm. like would I want that? Right. Or, or is there something that's like better about my own limitations? Like the fact that I can't draw a lot of things makes me do like kind of shortcuts and workaroons, but then that becomes my style. And I think that you've, you can probably like think of mm -hmm. this, like you've probably known people like this that are very, very good technical artists, but like if they have to draw something like cartoon style, like they just can't because they just find it so challenging and weird to draw something in a minimalistic, stylized, symbolic way. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, back to Al Hirschfeld, right? That was his thing was he could achieve such a perfect likeness of, of someone with as few lines as possible. And there's something so elegant about that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot, a lot of, a lot of, you know, I mean, his art was like black and white, no color, just simple lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in that sense, it's like, it's not technically advanced, but again, like you, there's probably a lot of like very, very technically skilled artists that could not do that even if they tried. So there is sure. something more complex to this phenomenon than just, you know, being good is some sort of like objective standard that, you know, we're all, you know, it's like a, you know, a, sort of a, a slope and it's like, you're either at the top of the slope or you're somewhere like crawling up towards that top where but really it's just, you know, a web that goes in a million different directions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a beautiful uh into the spider web <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed oh, um again i feel like i've i've t i've kept you here for way too long perhaps um but all right I, the audience liked it yeah yeah thank thank you to to all of the the chat again we had, we had some some smart comments it was hard for me to to keep up with and put them on the screen apologies yes. cuz like i said this is my first live stream um if i can ask you one one closing question yeah. because i'm I'm still thinking about what you're saying about the uh, kind of our culture of of self-loathing and stuff do you have any advice like maybe practical advice for young people today who are struggling with personal self-loathing what's something they can do to oh, feel better about themselves um well i don't know I, I feel like we all have things that we're proud of of ourselves you know talents that we have things that we're good at doing you know it could be ways that we look or or you know hobbies that we have or or you know collections that we have like there's lots of things like i think that nobody is ever completely hopeless nobody is ever living in a state of of complete patheticness in which they have nothing going for them and i think that it's just you have to allow yourself to be proud of what you've got going for you and I think that that is just something that a lot of people in their daily lives don't allow themselves to. Like they don't allow themselves to be, to be prideful. They don't allow themselves to be vain. They don't allow themselves to be like, you know, confident or, 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 or anything like that, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. these are emotions that can be bad in excess, but they can also be bad in 
absence. And I think that just too many times people have this kind of low key sense that they don't have a right to feel happy about themselves or proud of themselves or proud about anything that goes into their sort of creation of their of their identity. And so I, I just kind of think that like sometimes you just got to give people to be you got to just give people that permission structure that just say it's OK to 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 like you to like yourself and to like the person that you are. You know, it seems like very sort of basic stuff, but I think that that's the only way that we sort of like truly overcome this kind of thing is, is like it does sort of have to happen one person at a time. And I think because in some ways we're all microcosms of our larger civilization, right? Like if I think of myself and it's like, you know, how do I live? What do I like? What is my house full of? How do I dress and carry myself? You know, what are my mm -hmm. hobbies? What are my talents? What is my job? You know, I am, you know, one sort of creature within this larger elaborate uh, civilization that we inhabit. And if we all felt a little bit more sort of positive about ourselves and the degree that we're all just kind of like one small puzzle piece in this giant thing, you know, maybe we would be more collectively happy and, and thus more, you know, productive and confident and civilizationally secure, which is, I think, something that we all need to be concerned about in, in this uh, in this new decade. Wow. JJ, your your words are, I don't know, they're, they're almost utopian, you know, almost too good to be true, but I I, I receive them and I'm, I'm going to be marinating on them. <laughs> Well, for a while now thank you so much jeffrey it you know it, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you and it, it's i appreciate you being so kind to me as well that you reached out to me and wanted me to participate in this i mean i've been enjoying your stuff for a while you know it was it was so cool this this whole sort of thing with the shirt you know yeah like yeah the, the whole impetus of making a, a video that i was very uh very proud of. I feel like it turned out well. I am pleased with myself for making a decent video, but I'm also uh, I'm also happy that uh, you know I was uh, able to get in contact with you and that you were able to sort of help me make that video as good as it was as well. Because your your very compelling and interesting story sort of provided the the narrative hook. So I'm happy to give back to you now in the form of your little uh, in the form of this chat. Oh yeah, well. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I uh, I don't I felt pretty starstruck when you first started following me. I, I assumed it was like a a fake account or something. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I remember trying to explain it to my friends uh, who were like, man, JJ McClue followed me. I couldn't believe it. And like, of course, no one else like, knew who you were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, it was still, it, it felt, uh, it was a special moment for me, especially the thought of like, wow, I get to actually be featured in in a jj video how cool is that <laughs> no of course but you know i'm just 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 some guy mm. at the end of the day it's i mean that's the other thing too is like you know everybody's just some guy at the end of the day you know we're all we're all very similar you know so people should not be don't be overly intimidated particularly like when you're starting out and you're trying to like you know build your your identity in this in this new field i I, ho I hope you do more chats like this with more sort of artists and creators that you respect because i think you'd be surprised how receptive and willing a lot of them are celebrities they're just like us <laughs> that's what they say <laughs> all right well uh let's see this has been jj talks to jeffrey thank you to everyone who's been watching thank you for your your beautiful chats <laughs> and uh yeah we will catch you on the next one be well <laughs>